Okay, so today we are going to talk about hyperkalemia, excess potassium in the body, and its causes and effects. All the investigations that you need to do, and the treatment of hyperkalemia. Normal levels of potassium are from 3.5 to 5.2 milli equivalent per liter. Excess potassium hyperkalemia can occur due to end stage renal disease. Since kidneys maintain the normal level of potassium in the blood whenever there is problem with the kidneys in end stage renal disease potassium levels in the blood go up insulin deficiency can also cause hyperkalemia this mainly occurs in diabetics in which there is insulin deficiency basically insulin drives potassium into the cells with glucose insulin causes potassium to move into the cells just like glucose insulin deficiency results in hyperkalemia aldosterone antagonist like spironolactone cause hyperkalemia why basically aldosterone causes reabsorption of sodium from the kidneys and loss of potassium into the urine so whenever aldosterone is antagonized with a drug that aldosterone cannot act so the loss of potassium into the urine is stopped and potassium level in blood increase acidosis can also cause hyperkalemia basically whenever the ph of the blood is low and there are excess hydrogen ions in the blood body tries to normalize the ph by pushing hydrogen ions into the cells in exchange for potassium so potassium moves out of the cells into the blood and hydrogen moves into the cells excess potassium in the blood result in hyperkalemia so in order to normalize the ph of the body body pushes in hydrogen into the cells and takes out potassium from the cells into the blood pseudo hyperkalemia is a very important cause why because in this condition your body is not having excess potassium in the blood but your labs are showing that there is hyperkalemia in the body it happens due to wrong venipuncture technique wrong injection technique basically whenever a person is drawing out blood and he draws out blood very quickly the rbcs which are bag of potassium they rupture within the syringe rupture of rbcs within the syringe causes loss of potassium from the cells and that loss of potassium from the cells cause potassium levels to go up in the sample that you have taken so the sample contains high potassium levels due to hemolysis of rbcs within the syringe whenever a patient presents to you with hyperkalemia and your labs show greater than 5.5 potassium the next thing you have to do is you have to perform ecg ecg is the first thing that you have to do why because excess potassium affects heart directly and it causes arrhythmia and arrhythmia is the most common cause of death in hyperkalemia so you have to protect the heart you have to assess the heart first and you do ecg to assess the condition of heart you also recheck the venous sample to exclude pseudo hyperkalemia maybe this hyperkalemia was due to wrong injection technique wrong withdrawal of blood that resulted in rupture of rbcs within the sample resulting in pseudo hyperkalemia so you take a sample again with the proper technique a proper venous sample to exclude pseudo hyperkalemia if the ecg is normal and potassium levels are also normal it means that there is no hyperkalemia and heart is totally normal it excludes hyperkalemia there was no hyperkalemia in this patient if you perform ecg and ecg shows changes changes like peaked t wave tall t waves you receive an ecg like this in this if you see these are all the t waves p q r s and this is the t wave these are all the t waves that you can see on ecg these t waves show that the high potassium levels are affecting heart now and these can progress to arrhythmias and kill this patient so what you need to do is you have to uh, normalize this patient you have to protect his heart and you have to lower down potassium levels so the first thing in the treatment of this patient in patient who is having hyperkalemia with ecg changes you have to stabilize heart for stabilizing the heart you have to give iv calcium gluconate iv calcium gluconate 
stabilize the heart and protects the heart from getting arrhythmias due to high potassium levels. IV calcium gluconate does not lower down potassium level. It just protects the heart. Now you have stabilized the heart. You also have to lower down potassium levels. For lowering down the potassium levels, you have to temporize the patient. You have to give insulin with dextrose. As we said that insulin drives potassium into the cells with glucose. So if you are giving insulin, it will push potassium into the cell and serum potassium will go down. With that, you also have to give dextrose because patient can develop hypoglycemia by giving insulin. So you also give glucose with it. You also give beta agonist in the form of nebulizers. You give nebulized albuterol and beta agonist also drive potassium into the cells. You also give sodium bicarbonate to lower down the potassium levels. Now we did all this to lower down the potassium levels acutely. We pushed potassium from the serum into the cells so the serum potassium would go down. But the total body potassium is still high. Whether it is in the cells, whether it is in the plasma, total potassium is still high. And you have to lower down the total potassium out of the body. So you can lower down potassium levels by two ways. Either you lose it in stools or you lose it in urine. Loops diuretic cause loss of potassium in urine. And k exhalate is a resin that binds potassium and causes its loss in the stool. So loop diuretics cause loss of potassium in the urine and k exhalate causes loss of potassium in the stools. Now there is a third patient, a third patient in which ECG is normal and potassium levels are high. It means that there is hyperkalemia since our second sample also shows high potassium level, but it is not affecting heart. So this patient does not need cal calcium gluconate. This patient does not need temporization. All you need to do is to slowly and gradually lower down potassium levels. Lowering down potassium level takes time. We did all this to lower down potassium level acutely in a symptomatic patient in which it was affecting heart. But in a patient in which ECG is normal and heart is not affected, what you need to do is you have to slowly lower down potassium levels. You lower down total body potassium by giving loop diuretics and exhalate. So this was all the treatment of hyperkalemia. Now I'll briefly talk about what are the ECG changes that you can see with hyperkalemia. When the levels of potassium are from 6 to 7 milli equivalent, you see a prolonged PR interval and tall T waves. Whenever the potassium level is from 7 to 8 milli equivalent per liter, there is loss of P wave and there is ST segment elevation with tall T wave. And whenever potassium levels exceed 8 milli equivalent per liter, arrhythmias begins to appear. And there is sine wave rhythm, which is very close to getting an arrhythmia. In summary, hyperkalemia can occur due to end stage renal disease and pseudo hyperkalemia acidosis and drugs like aldosterone antagonist and insulin deficiency. First thing that you need to do is you have to check ECG and you also exclude pseudo hyperkalemia by sending another sample and ECG and potassium levels are normal. There is no hyperkalemia. If ECG shows peak T waves and potassium levels are greater than 5.5, the first thing is you have to stabilize heart by IV calcium gluconate and you have to lower down the potassium levels acutely by pushing the potassium into the cells, but slowly and gradually you also have to lower down potassium by giving uh, loop diuretics and k exhalate. If ECG is normal and potassium levels are greater than 5.5, it means that you have to slowly and gradually lower down potassium levels by giving loop diuretics and k exhalate. These are the ECG changes that you see with hyperkalemia, tall T waves and ST segment elevation and at the end sine wave rhythm that results in arrhythmia, tall T waves being the most specific. So this was hyperkalemia. Thank you very much.